Welcome to Daily Wisdom, Walking the Path with the Buddha, a podcast shared by David Roylance. This podcast is dedicated to guiding you to completely eliminate the discontent mind and the suffering it causes by attaining enlightenment. Learn and practice the teachings of Gotama Buddha that will guide you to fully attain a peaceful, calm, serene, and content mind with joy. To support this podcast, visit patreon.com forward slash support Buddha or visit buddhadailywisdom.com where you will discover a full range of courses, retreats, and online learning resources to assist you on the path to enlightenment. Now, here's our teacher to share more. Sawadee Hello and welcome to Daily Wisdom, Walking the Path with the Buddha. Today is our Pali Canon in English study group where we study the words of the Buddha. We're in volume 13, which is titled Generosity. We're going to be exploring chapter 61 through 70 today, where a student will be reading the chapter. I'll be sharing teachings on that chapter, and then I'll open up to any questions that you guys might have. If you've read these ahead of time, you might have some questions. If you haven't read these ahead of time, we're going to be reading those in class, so you'll be able to learn right along with us. And if you'd like to read these chapters in the future prior to class, you can download them from buddhadailywisdom.com and click on the free books and you'll be able to download these books for free. And then perhaps you might decide to read prior to class and or after class because there's the words of the Buddha. There's a reference to go back to the original Pali Canon. And then there's the teachings that I'm sharing that will help you further understand and further reflect on what it is that the Buddha is actually teaching. So I'd like to welcome all of you to our class today and invite you to join us for a brief meditation that we will typically do prior to each class. This will help you to kind of clear the mind and then be able to retain more of the teachings as we progress in our class today. So we usually do about a 10 minute meditation prior to the actual class. So if you'd like to go ahead and get into meditation position, I'll start with some chanting, which you're able to chant along if you like. And then I'll just do some very brief guidance to help you in getting into your meditation. And then we'll come out with some more chanting. Satisatatawa manu 
นะพุทโธภาควาติโอเคคุณจะต้องใช้ชีวิตของคุณทั้งในนั้นและในนั้นทั้งในนั้นที่นี่คุณจะต้องใช้ชีวิตของคุณทั้งในนั้นและในนั้นที่นี่คุณจะต้องใช้ชีวิตของคุณทั้งในนั้นและในนั้นที่นี่คุณจะต้องใช้ชีวิตของคุณทั้งในนั้นและในนั้นที่นี่คุณจะต้องใช้ชีวิตของคุณทั้งในนั้นและในนั้นที่นี่คุณจะต้องใช้ชีวิตของคุณทั้งในนั้นและในนั้นที่นี่คุณจะต้องใช้ชีวิตของคุณทั้งในนั้น Fixate the mind on the breath, the present moment. If you observe that the mind moves off the breath, cut that off, let it go, and come back to the breath, the present moment. Breathing in, in out.
would like to make your way out of meditation we'll go ahead and transition over to the part of our class where we read the chapters and then I'll share teachings on that chapter and then we'll open up to any questions that you guys might have we're starting with chapter 61 and it's essentially you the students who are really orchestrating the class I'm just here for guidance so I'm going to turn things over to the moderators to guide us through today's class Chapter 61, Persons Who Are Worthy of Gifts, Fifth Discourse. Monks, possessing six qualities, a monk is worthy of gifts, worthy of hospitality, worthy of offerings, worthy of respectful salutation, and unsurpassed field of merit for the world. What six? The faculty of confidence, the faculty of energy, the faculty of mindfulness, the faculty of concentration, the faculty of wisdom, and with the destruction of the taints, he has realized for himself with direct knowledge or experience in his very life, the taintless liberation of mind, liberation by wisdom, and having entered upon it, he resides in it. Possessing these six qualities, a monk is worthy of gifts, worthy of hospitality, worthy of offerings, worthy of respectful salutation, and unsurpassed view of merit for the world. All right. Thank you, Donnie. So this is volume 13 titled Generosity. And we've been studying many chapters here at now 61, where the Buddha has talked at different times in his teachings about who to practice generosity with. I've explained in previous classes where the purpose of practicing generosity where you're giving and sharing more than is strictly required is to actually help you to eliminate craving, desire, attachment. This is helping you to eliminate discontentedness because it's craving, desire, attachment that is 
causing discontentedness. So if you're practicing giving and sharing, eliminating selfishness in the mind, it's helping you to eliminate the craving desire attachment. Thus, it's helping you to eliminate discontentedness. And this is going to help you get closer and closer to enlightenment. When you practice generosity with just anybody, this is actually helping you to develop the mind, get closer and closer to enlightenment, eliminating the craving, desire, attachment. And this is called generosity. When you are practicing generosity towards ordained practitioners or teachers or temples and helping the continuation of sharing the teachings of the Buddha, this is called merit. So here, the Buddha is once again explaining the types of individuals that you would be interested to develop merit and who you would make offerings to in order to develop merit. And he's given lots of different guidance on that at different times throughout this book and throughout the various chapters in the entire book series. And here he's honing in on specific qualities to look for in an individual that you would be interested to practice generosity with in order to support the continued sharing of the teachings and thus cultivate merit. Because if you are practicing generosity with virtuous ordained practitioners or virtuous teachers who are sharing these teachings, then those offerings that you're making is directly contributing to the benefit of continuing the teachings in the world. And that person would be actively involved in sharing the teachings in the world. And then you would be able to come in contact with somebody who's deeply rooted into the path to enlightenment and into the teachings. And thus you'd be able to gain wisdom of how to further your practice. So it's really important that as you make offerings to any ordained practitioners or teachers, that you look for virtuous practitioners, virtuous teachers, virtuous ordained practitioners, because it's going to benefit you, yes, because you're eliminating craving, desire, attachment. It's also going to benefit you in that you're cultivating wisdom through coming in contact with those individuals who are practicing the teachings and sharing them very deeply. But those same individuals, by supporting them, they're going to also be able to help other people in the world to learn the teachings as well. So here the Buddha talks about these six criteria or these six qualities that he's suggesting that one look for. And these are in addition to all the other chapters where he talked about other qualities too. Here he's talking about confidence. What this is, is this is confidence in the Buddha, the teachings, and the community. This is the opposite of doubt. That fetter of doubt, the second fetter, would need to be eliminated in order to get to the first stage of enlightenment. And the way that you do that is through learning and reflecting and practicing the teachings so that you deeply understand what the teachings are. And as you're practicing them and you see the transformation of the mind in your life improving, you gradually erode this doubt about the teachings doubt about the community that you're part of and doubt about the Buddha of whether or not he was actually a Buddha or not. So if you have this faculty of confidence, it means that you've eliminated doubt and that now you have no doubt in your mind whatsoever that the Buddha was indeed an actual Buddha, that his teachings indeed are leading to a better and improved condition of mind and improved life and that the community that you're part of is supportive and encouraging and helping you in your growth. And you don't get to this confidence by just snapping the fingers and, you know, blind confidence. Instead, it's through that investigation of the teachings, independently verifying them through your reflection and then practicing to transform the mind, eliminating more and more pollution of mind. And as you see the mind becoming more peaceful, calm, serene, and content with joy, closer to the enlightened mental state, this is where the confidence starts to arise in the mind and you eventually erode and eliminate the fetter of doubt. So this is the first faculty that he's talking about, the first quality of mind. The next one is this faculty of energy. This relates to the seven factors of enlightenment. The seven factors of enlightenment are designed to help you fine tune the mind. Sometimes people think it's how to determine if somebody is enlightened or not, but that's not actually what they're there for. They're actually there to fine tune the mind in order to bring it more to the middle. So there's mindfulness, which is the first factor of enlightenment, which is also the next faculty, which we're going to be talking about in a moment. And then when the mind is dull and lethargic and complacent, the Buddha talks about practicing the enlightenment 
dynamic factor of investigation where you're investigating his teachings and this brings up energy in the mind where there's this willingness to do something there's initiative it's really the opposite of dullness and lethargic and then there's this joy that springs up in the mind so a person who's practicing the enlightenment factor of energy is going to be having initiative they're going to be actively sharing the teachings they're going to be involved in sharing the teachings with a large community in terms of an ordained practitioner or a teacher but even just an enlightened being who's choosing not to actually share the teachings they may have decided that they're not going to share the teachings as a teacher because not everybody's going to be a teacher there's going to be enlightened business people politicians stay-at-home moms and dads and grandmothers and grandfathers and all these different people so the enlightenment factor of energy is not having a dull and lethargic mind but instead having this initiative this enthusiasm this motivation to do things in the world but without craving desire attachment that's where the mind comes into the middle where it's not dull and lethargic but it's not chasing things through craving either instead it's practicing this enlightenment factor of energy or the way the buddha is describing it here is the faculty of energy the faculty of mindfulness is the awareness of mind and this should be practiced all the time that if you're going to purify the mind you need to have awareness of the mind and specifically the four foundations of mindfulness of being aware of the bodily sensations that are occurring prior to discontentedness arising, the feelings in the mind, that's those pleasant feelings, painful feelings, neither painful nor pleasant, the condition of the mind and how these feelings actually affect the condition of the mind long term, where like maybe for a few hours or a few days or a week or two, you've experienced where the mind has been angry or frustrated. This is because of the mind being discontent from craving desire attachment of course but because one doesn't have mindfulness they're not aware that this cycle is happening where there's bodily sensations feelings there's the condition of the mind that's affected and then it's feeding these mental objects so someone who has the faculty of mindfulness will have full awareness of the mind and they'll have these four foundations of mindfulness and being aware of all those four foundations of bodily sensations feelings condition of the mind and mental objects and this is one of the qualities that the buddha is saying that someone that you would practice generosity with in order to produce merit should be practicing mindfulness then there's concentration this is also an aspect of the seven factors of enlightenment it's also part of the eightfold path just like mindfulness is part of the eightfold path the buddha's teachings interconnect in different ways but what concentration is is concentration is having focus having clarity of mind being able to focus on one particular thing there's other parts of his teachings where he talks about someone who's muddle-minded their mind isn't very focused maybe it rambles it chit chats it goes over here and goes over there you know there's the mind just kind of bounces from thing to thing to thing it's not really focused on any one particular thing with clarity so what you would like to look for is somebody who has concentration because if they have concentration through practicing the teachings of the buddha then they would have developed their mind to a certain point that they're experiencing the results of this concentration if someone has a very muddled mind where they're rambling they're chit-chatting maybe they're delivering teachings of the buddha but they wander off and talk about this thing and that thing and all these things that are unrelated to his actual teachings then this person's mind isn't necessarily concentrated so they're not practicing very deeply and they're not then going to be able to actually share the teachings to help others because their own mind isn't yet concentrated so they wouldn't be able to help others to develop that concentration so the buddha is saying look for somebody that has the quality of concentration and then he talks about wisdom whenever he talks about wisdom he's talking about wisdom about the path to enlightenment about his teachings the three universal truths the four noble truths the eightfold path the five precepts the natural law of gamma all these different teachings the ten fetters meditation someone who's practicing really closely and who's worthy of 
gifts and hospitality and offerings and reverential salutations, this unsurpassed field of merit for the world, will have deep wisdom about the teachings because they would have needed to cultivate that through learning, reflecting, and practicing. And then they'll be able to share that with others. So in order to create merit that is going to be beneficial in the continuation and the sharing of the teachings, the person that you make offerings to, you would like to be sure that they have wisdom about the teachings. And the way that you'll know that they have wisdom is that you'll be able to independently verify their teachings. Because there's a lot of people in the world that talk about teachings of the Buddha and they say that what they're sharing are the teachings of the Buddha. But how do you discern whether these teachings that they're sharing are true or if they're false? Because there's a lot of misunderstanding in the world about the teachings of the Buddha. Well, you should see that they base their teachings in the words of the Buddha, that they should be very well versed in the Pali Canon and what the Buddha actually taught related to his teachings because they're the original teachings is the Pali Canon. So they would be well versed in the words of the Buddha and whatever they share would be independently verifiable. You should be able to take the three universal truths that they share and go out and independently verify those. Or the Four Noble Truths, you should be able to go out and independently verify those. When they explain the Eightfold Path, you should be able to go out and independently verify that through your reflection and through your practice that it's actually working. So if somebody is just sharing teachings that they're calling Buddhist, and maybe they even use the term the Four Noble Truths or the Eightfold Path and other things, if they're not basing their teachings in the words of the Buddha, and those teachings aren't independently verifiable, then they're not yet having cultivated this wisdom. And it wouldn't be wise to support someone who's not truly sharing the true path that the Buddha laid out through his words and through independently verifiable teachings. And then the Buddha says, okay, what you're looking for is this person who's destroyed the taints. This is the fetters. This is the pollutions of mind, those 10 individual fetters. An individual who's enlightened will have destroyed the taints. They will have eliminated the fetters. They will have completely transformed the mind away from the pollution, and now the mind will be enlightened. So not only will they have these qualities that he's talking about here of confidence, energy, mindfulness, concentration, and wisdom, but they won't have any traces of the fetters or those taints or those pollutions. And then through that direct experience of having trained their mind to eliminate the fetters, now in this very life, their mind is taintless, meaning their mind is no longer polluted. They're experiencing this liberation of mind, meaning they no longer experience discontentedness. They no longer experience strong feelings of conditioned happiness, excitement, elation, thrill, euphoria. They no longer experience anger, sadness, frustration, irritation, annoyance, guilt, shame, fear, stress, anxiety. All of these discontent feelings and others are eliminated when the mind is liberated. It's taintless because it's gotten rid of the pollutions of mind. It's now free. It's free of those strong feelings. And the way that an individual liberates their mind is by wisdom, that by learning not believing the teachings, but learning them, reflecting on them to independently verify them, and then practicing them as you're practicing and you're transforming the mind. This is the wisdom of the teachings of the Buddha that's helping you to get to that liberation by wisdom. And now, having entered upon enlightenment is what he's talking about here. He resides in it, meaning that enlightenment is permanent. Right? It's not like, okay, one day somebody's really nice and friendly, the next day they're angry and disgruntled. This is a mind that's not yet in enlightenment. If somebody's enlightened, you would see in every interaction that you interact with them that their mind is calm and peaceful and joyful, that they're loving and kind and compassionate. You're not seeing any irritation or even the slightest annoyance in their mind. So that's when the mind is residing in enlightenment. It enters into enlightenment and now they reside in it. And what the Buddha is helping you to see here is kind of a, a shorthand way to determine whether somebody's actually enlightened or not. You're not judging them. You're not looking down upon people who aren't enlightened. You're not looking 
up to people and putting yourself beneath them if they are enlightened. So you're not doing this measuring and comparing. The Buddha is just giving you wisdom to make wise decisions or discernment about where do you share your offerings. Because if you're practicing generosity in the middle way, you don't have an enormous amount of resources to be able to share with every single teacher and every single ordained practitioner. There's countless people in the world that are sharing these teachings. So you would like to find somebody who's virtuous and who's got these particular qualities that the Buddha is talking about because that's where you're going to be able to experience this enormous amount of merit where you're eliminating your craving, you're cultivating wisdom yourself by coming into contact with that person, but then also that person is sharing the teachings in a way that's helping other people to get to enlightenment. And an enlightened being who decides to be a teacher, they're going to be able to help many, many, many people in the world. So this is who the Buddha is recommending that you share your offerings with. What questions do you guys have on this chapter? It doesn't appear there are any questions at this time, sir. Okay, so we'll go to chapter 62. Um, yes, sir, I'll read chapter 62. Persons who are worthy of gifts, <clears throat> the sixth discourse. So too, Badali, when a monk possesses 10 qualities, he is worthy of gifts, worthy of hospitality, worthy of offerings, worthy of respectful salutation, an unsurpassed field of merit for the world. Well, what are the 10? Here, Badali, a monk possesses the right view of one beyond training, the right intention of one beyond training, the right speech of one beyond training, the right action of one beyond training, the right livelihood of one beyond training, the right effort of one beyond training, the right mindfulness of one beyond training, the right concentration of one beyond training, the right wisdom of one beyond training, and the right liberation of one beyond training. When a monk possesses these 10 qualities, he is worthy of gifts, worthy of hospitality, worthy of offerings, worthy of respectful salutation, and unsurpassed field of merit for the world. Okay, thank you, Miranda. So once again, the Buddha here is describing an enlightened being because an enlightened being is going to be practicing what's called the tenfold path. It's the eightfold path that you learn all the individual steps, and that's what leads to enlightenment. And through practicing the eightfold path and all the connected teachings, you then develop the ninth and tenth factor, which is right wisdom and right liberation. There isn't anything specific to teach you about right wisdom and right liberation other than the full cultivation of wisdom, where you get to what's called final knowledge, where you fully develop the entire path to enlightenment and you've independently verified the teachings. You acquire final knowledge or this right wisdom where now the mind has the full wisdom of the entire path and it's beyond training because you already fully deeply understand it and because of fully cultivating the eightfold path which leads to right wisdom now the mind experiences right liberation which means it no longer experiences any discontentedness so an enlightened being of all types whether they're a teacher or not they're going to be practicing the tenfold path but it's the eightfold path that leads up to that so if you're looking for somebody to share offerings with, you would look for somebody that deeply understands each one of these factors. What is right view and what is right intention, right speech, right action, right livelihood, right effort, right mindfulness, right concentration. And once again, they should base those teachings on the words of the Buddha. And the Buddha is saying that this individual is beyond training, meaning not only do they intellectually understand these teachings, not only did they reflect on them, but they're practicing them so that they no longer ever blame anyone else for anything that's happening in their life or they have this right intention which is the three aspects of right intention that you can learn in the words of the buddha and you would be able to see that this person is practicing that and the same thing with all these other factors on the eightfold path when you understand them in the words of the buddha and you see that somebody is practicing these their mind is enlightened they've got all 10 factors then the buddha is saying this is a person who's worthy of gifts and offerings and this would be an unsurpassed field of merit for the world having an enlightened being in the world is the very best thing that could ever happen because now that individual is going to be functioning in society in a really wonderful way that's going to gradually help others but then somebody who's teaching the teachings who's actually enlightened they're going to be able to help countless people to be able to 
share the teachings and be able to benefit the world through sharing those teachings. And that's why the Buddha says it's an unsurpassed field of merit for the world, meaning it's going to highly benefit the world to be able to support an enlightened being who's teaching and sharing the teachings. And that's why the Buddha is suggesting to direct your generous offerings to that individual. Because if you can imagine during the lifetime of a Buddha, there was countless people that were around and they were learning his teachings and not all of them were practicing them closely. So he always prefaced any kind of offerings that he suggested for people to make to support the virtuous practitioners. And if somebody's enlightened, then they surely are virtuous and practicing these teachings really well. What questions do you guys have on this chapter? doesn't appear there are any questions at this time. Okay, chapter 63. Okay, and I think Bunny is going to read that for us, sir. Perfect. Persons who are worthy of gift, servant, is cause. So two positive four factors. A monk is worthy of gift, worthy of hospitality, worthy of offerings, worthy of respectful salutation, and unsurpassed field of merit for the world. What for? Here a monk is skilled in places a long distance tutor and one who split a great body. And how monk is a monk skilled in places? Here a monk is virtuous practicing moral conduct. He resides restrained by the training guidelines consists of wholesome conduct and wise decision making, seeing danger in the slightest faults. Having undertaken the training guidelines, he trains his he trains in them. It is in this way that a monk is killed in places. And how is a monk a long distance shooter here in a kind of form what whatsoever with the past, future or present, internal or external, gross or subtle, inferior or superior, far or near, a monk sees old form as it really is with correct wisdom. Thus, this is not mine, it is I am not. This is not myself. Any kind of feeling whatsoever, any kind of perception whatsoever, any kind of volitional formations, choices, decisions whatsoever, any kind of consciousness whatsoever, whether past, future, or present, internal or external, gross or subtle, inferior or superior, far or near, a monk sees all consciousness as it really is with correct wisdom thus. This is not mine, this I am not. This is not myself. It is in this way where uh, that a monk is a long distance shooter. And how is a monk a sharp shooter? Here a monk understands as it really is. This is discontentness. He understands as it really is. This is the cause of this contentedness, he understands as it really is. This is the elimination of this contentedness. He understands as it really is. This is the way leading to the elimination of this contentedness. It is in this way that a monk is a sharp shooter and how is a monk one who splits a great bodies? Here a monk splits the great mass of ignorance. 
unknowing of true reality. It is in this way that a monk is one who splits the, a great body, possessing these four qualities. A monk is worthy of gift, worthy of hospitality, worthy of offerings, worthy of respectful salutation and unsurpassed field of merit for the world. All right. Thank you, sir. I think that might be Banya's husband. <laughs> I know Banya. She's here in Thailand. So thank you, sir. I appreciate you reading that. So here, this is once again, the Buddha describing certain qualities to look for in somebody that you're making offerings to. And as common in the way that the Buddha taught is he oftentimes took something that people were already familiar with, and then he cast his teachings into that. And here what he's talking about is an archer, somebody who is a long distance shooter, a sharp shooter, one that can split a great body, because these are things that people would have been familiar with during that lifetime in, in the arching. So here, this first one, he talks about a monk who is skilled in places, who knowing various places, because during the lifetime of the Buddha, people didn't travel very much. You know, they pretty much knew the local area right around you, where nowadays, you know, we might know far off distant places from where we actually live. So knowing places and knowing where things are in the world, this is actually very helpful. So being skilled in places for an archer would be helpful because they'd be able to know the lay of the land and they would be better at their craft. So the same thing here is the Buddha saying that knowing the lay of your land in terms of this path to enlightenment, being virtuous or practicing wholesome moral conduct, you'd like to look for that in somebody who you're considering to make offerings to. That means they'd be practicing right speech, right action, right livelihood. Someone who's able to restrain their mind, right? This is restrained by the training guidelines. This is the training that the Buddha shared that you don't see them indulging in all kinds of central pleasures. So if you're making offerings to somebody and they're driving a Lamborghini and a Ferrari, they've got a mansion and three private jets and things like this, this is somebody who's using those offerings for their own personal enrichment rather than what the Buddha would have taught, which is use a little bit of those funds and a little bit of those resources in order to sustain your life with food, water, clothing, shelter, and medical care. But then as there's extra resources, that should be going into developing the community to share the teaching. So I can speak from my own experience, things like purchasing Zoom or purchasing lights or microphones at the temple. You know, there's carpets, there's water, there's signs to tell people about the classes. There's various things like this that we need to purchase in order to continue to share these teachings. Whereas if somebody wasn't restrained by the training guidelines, when they're getting offerings from the public, they would be then using those offerings for their own self-pleasure. And that's not what the Buddha taught to do, that when people are making offerings to us, we should be using that for the basic necessities to sustain our life. And then those offerings should be returned to the community as a way of setting up an environment that's conducive to learning, whether nowadays it's online or at the temple or what have you. A teacher who's receiving offerings from their students should be using a good portion of that to help continue the teachings and continue to share the teachings with their community. And then possessed of wholesome conduct and wise decision making. This is pretty obvious, right? And seeing the danger in the slightest faults. So someone who understands the teachings well enough that with that wisdom, even the slightest little fault, they would understand that there's quite danger in that because any harm that we put out, any unwise decisions, it's going to come back to us. So a teacher who's sharing these teachings closely and that you might be interested to support would possess these things. Then the Buddha also talks about a long distance shooter. This is someone who understands that the five aggregates are not you or who you are. He's talking here about someone who's eliminated personal existence view and who's realized non-self. So when I talk about non-self, I talk about it as the self-image and the self-identity. And this is how I introduce it to people. But more fully, what the Buddha is describing is that you aren't these five aggregates. When the Buddha describes what a living being is, 
He says a living being has the five aggregates, which are form, feelings, perceptions, volitional formations, and a consciousness. This is how you determine what a living being is, that they have these five things. So for example, a human or an animal, we have physical form, we have feelings, we have perceptions, the way things seem to be in the world. We make choices and decisions, and we have a consciousness or a mind. But a tree, they have physical form, but they don't have feelings, they don't have perceptions, they don't make choices and decisions. A tree can't decide to uproot itself, walk down the street, and replant itself. And the reason why is because it doesn't have a consciousness. We might consider a tree to be alive, and that's a really nice thought because then we respect the plants more, but they're not a living being the way that they're described through the five aggregates. So a person who you might decide to make offerings to understands that this physical form, this body is not who they are. The feelings that get experienced in the mind is not who they are. Any perceptions or choices and decisions and even this mind, it's not who they are. The Buddha says, this is not mine. This I am not. This is not myself. This means that somebody has fully realized non-self and they've eliminated personal existence view. So if you are around a teacher who understands this and who's practicing this, then they will be a person that you might consider to make offerings to. And then this sharpshooter is someone who understands the Four Noble Truths. That's what is described here. Right? That's the real core of the teachings. That's the very first thing. If you're going to make offerings to someone to produce merit in order to continue the teachings in the world, they would have to know the Four Noble Truths. There's no way anybody could ever make any progress on the path to enlightenment without establishing right view. And that requires the understanding of the Four Noble Truths. So anybody who you might consider to make offerings to, you would like to ensure that they understand the problem, which is discontentedness, the cause of the problem, which is craving, desire, attachment, the elimination of the problem, which is the elimination of craving, desire, attachment. That's how you eliminate discontentedness. And the way leading to the elimination of discontentedness is the Eightfold Path. So you would like an individual who you make offerings to to understand these Four Noble Truths and the Eightfold Path because that's the way to liberation and to enlightenment. Then number four is a monk who splits a great body. The Buddha here is talking about someone who essentially has eliminated this ignorance or this unknowing of true reality, someone who has arisen wisdom in the mind. This person who has eliminated ignorance fully, they're actually enlightened. So the Buddha is talking about enlightened beings here, and he's talking about it in each chapter a slightly different way to help you approach it and look at it from different angles. Because depending on what your wisdom is, you might look at it through the Eightfold Path, or you might look at it through these criteria or some others that he shares. Because Ignorance and the eradication of ignorance requires certain intellectual learning, but there needs to be reflection and independent verification, but there also needs to be practice. If somebody isn't practicing the teachings, they haven't eliminated the ignorance or the unknowing of true reality. Somebody might know that maybe killing, stealing, sexual misconduct, lying, or substances that cause heedlessness is unwise. They might know that as part of the five precepts. That's the intellectual learning. They might have even reflected on that and realized that it's independently verifiable that yes, these things do lead to harm and harm is going to come to me. But they may not be practicing them. You might still see individuals who are choosing to share teachings that might intellectually understand the five precepts and might even teach them, but they're not yet practicing them. So what you're looking for, for somebody who has eliminated ignorance, is that they're practicing the teachings, not just the five precepts, but the entire eightfold path. And that's how you know that this person is actually enlightened and they've eradicated ignorance because they're practicing the teachings. They're not just intellectually understanding them. What questions do you guys have on this chapter? It appears Miranda has the question, sir. Sure. Yes, thank you, Christy. Um, going back to this part here, number two, any kind of feeling whatsoever. On YouTube, Tonka asks, many times we hear that feelings are our inner compass to what is wholesome and what is not. Could you give some guidance on this, sir? 
Yeah, this I wouldn't agree with. If you're experiencing discontentedness, which is conditioned feelings, right? Those conditioned feelings of pleasant, painful, neither painful nor pleasant. This can be a warning sign for you, like the red light on your dashboard, that there's craving, desire, attachment in the mind. But ultimately, you're going to be able to eliminate those conditioned feelings and they'll no longer exist in the mind. So we don't need feelings in order to be an inner compass for us. The inner compass is your wisdom. That's what your inner compass is. Because once you have cultivated wisdom, then you can discern what is wholesome and what is unwholesome. You don't need feelings to tell you what that is. These are just getting in the way of a peaceful, calm, serene, and content mind with joy. So when you eliminate the craving, desire, attachment that's producing the conditioned feelings, you can get those out of the way. Now the mind can be calm, steady, peaceful, stable all the time. It can be joyful all the time. And here the Buddha is saying that as you're experiencing these discontent feelings, it's important for you to understand that this isn't who you are as a person. Sometimes when you're in the process of getting to enlightenment, if you feel anger or sadness or guilt or shame or any of these other discontent feelings, you can become somewhat denigrating to yourself because you feel that, oh, I'm so angry all the time. I'm so bad or I'm such a bad person or these kind of things and it can actually make the situation worse where your mind becomes discontent because it's discontent so what helps you to to understand this is when you experience discontentedness any kind of conditioned feelings and we'll just use anger for example if you get angry or frustrated rather than get self-absorbed in that and allow it to degrade the mind and go downward in a downward spiral just realize all right the mind is angry but I am not angry. The mind is angry. The mind is having these angry feelings or the mind is frustrated, but it's not me. It's not who I am. I can eliminate these conditioned feelings and then I can experience this peaceful mind and this joyful mind. But as long as the mind thinks that these feelings are who you are, then the mind's going to cling to these feelings. And that's where the problems come in. So you would like to let go of these conditioned feelings of conditioned, pleasant, painful, neither painful nor pleasant, realizing that this isn't who you are as a person. These feelings don't make you who you are. So if you experience certain feelings at any time in your life or in the past, just let that go and realize that that's not who you are. And you can ascend and move further. You can awaken where the mind is no longer experiencing those conditioned feelings. And you can get to this peacefulness and this joy. Wonderful. Thank you, sir. Mm -hmm. You're welcome. I think that's all the questions we have right now, sir. Okay, so we'll move on to chapter 64. And I'll read that. Um, Persons who are worthy of gifts, so too monks, possessing five qualities, a monk who is worthy of gifts, worthy of hospitality, worthy of offerings, worthy of respect, respectful salutation, an unsurpassed field of merit for the world. What five? Here a monk who is one who listens, who destroys, who guards, who patiently endures, and who goes. And how is a monk one who listens? Here, when the teachings and discipline proclaimed by the Tahagata are being taught, a monk heeds it, attends to it, direct his whole mind to it and listens to the teachings with enthusiastic ears. It is in this way that a monk is one who listens. And two, how and how the monk one who destroys. Here a monk does not tolerate an arisen sensual thought, but abandons it, dispels it, terminates it, and obliterates it. He does not tolerate an arisen thought of ill will, an arisen thought of harming, and any other evil unwholesome states that arise from time to time, but abandons them, dispels them, terminates them, and obliterates them. It is in this way that a monk is one who destroys. Three, and how is a monk one who guards? Here, having seen a form with the eye, a monk does not grasp its marks and features. Since 
if we left the eyes sense base unrestrained evil unwholesome states of craving and aversion might invade him he practices restraint over it he guards the eye sense base he undertakes the restraint of the eye sense base having heard a sound with the ear having smelt an odor with the nose having taste of flavor with the tongue having touched a physical object with the body, having recognized a metal object, a mental object with the mind, he guards the mind sense space. He undertakes the restraint of the mind sense space. It is in this way that a monk is one who guards. And how is a monk one who patiently endures? Here a monk patiently endures cold and heat, hunger and thirst, contact with flies, mosquitoes, wind, the burning sun, and serpents, rude and offensive ways of speech. He is able to remain content with arisen bodily feelings that are painful, agonizing, sharp, piercing, distressing, disagreeable, weakening, one's vitality. It is in this way that a monk is one who patiently endures. And how is a monk one who goes? Here a monk is one who easily goes to that region where he has never before gone in this long time, that is to the stilling of all activities the letting go of all mental possessions, the destruction of craving, freedom from strong feelings, elimination, nibbana, enlightenment. It is in this way that a monk is one who goes. Possessing these five qualities, a monk is worthy of gifts, worthy of hospitality, worthy of offerings, worthy, worthy of respectful salutation, an unsurpassed field of merit for the world. All right. Thank you, Chrissy. So here the Buddha is describing once again an individual that you might consider to make offerings to, and we can explore each one of these so you guys understand them in detail. And also there's some things in here that you can pay attention to too for your own practice that you would like to develop these qualities. So like here, the first one, the Buddha talks about a monk who listens. Here he's talking about someone who's enthusiastically listening to his teachings and understanding them and heeding the guidance and then tending to that guidance and directing your mind towards understanding it, reflecting on it, and practicing it. This would be a quality that you would look for in somebody who you're going to make offerings to because if they're not interested in learning the teachings of the Buddha, how could they actually help other people? So this is what I was describing earlier, that anybody that you support with offerings, you would look for somebody who's sharing the words of the Buddha. If somebody's sharing, you know, some other teachings from someone else, you know, okay, you know, they can do that, you know, that's their goal. But in terms of the path to enlightenment, if you're looking to support someone who's on the path to enlightenment, sharing the path to enlightenment and helping others get to enlightenment, you'd be interested in supporting that person. It doesn't mean you can't support a charity or somebody else who's sharing some other teachings. But here, what the Buddha is explaining is that if somebody's sharing his teachings and who deeply understands his teachings and willing to listen and learn and understand and puts their whole mind into understanding their teachings. This is somebody who's doing the work on this path to enlightenment that he shared. And in terms of developing merit, as he talks about, that would be somebody you might consider to make offerings to. And then he talks about someone who's destroyed essentially these sensual thoughts, that they don't tolerate any kind of sensual thoughts, like sensual desires, what he's talking about, that fourth fetter, that someone isn't just complacent in allowing their sensual thoughts or their thoughts of ill will, which is the fifth fetter, that they don't allow that to permeate in the mind, that instead they cut that off and let it go. 
that they're not interested in allowing that to continue in the mind. So this is somebody who's not complacent and works to cut off and let go of central desire of ill will and any thoughts of harming. This comes back to right intention in the Eightfold Path, that as part of right intention, the Buddha describes these three aspects, the intention of renunciation, the intention of non-ill will, and the intention of harmlessness. So you should be able to observe that somebody who might have one of these thoughts arise, that they're not going forward, like he talked about in the previous chapter, you're, they're restraining the mind. They're cutting off and letting go anytime these things arise. Then he talks about one who guards. Here he's talking about the six sense spaces of the eyes, ears, nose, tongue, the body, and the mind. That if somebody has unrestrained sense spaces, then they're going to have craving and they're going to have aversion. And everybody has that at some point, but someone who you're looking to support who's practicing these teachings well would be guarding their sense bases, meaning that if the craving is arising, they're cutting that off and letting it go. Whereas if craving arises, then we oftentimes have a version where we're pushing away a certain situation or a certain person thinking that that's going to solve the problem when it actually doesn't. So a person who you're looking to support would understand and be practicing the elimination of craving and aversion, and they would be restraining their mind and they wouldn't allow the mind to cling to these things. Then the fourth one here, he talks about patience, that when this person is either in cold or heat or there's hunger or there's thirst or there's contact with flies, mosquitoes, wind, the burning sun, serpents, if there's rude and offensive ways of speech that someone's directing towards them, that this person is able to endure any kind of bodily feelings that are painful, like agonizing, sharp, piercing, distressing, disagreeable. Like if you experience like stumping your toe and you start yelling and hollering and cussing or whatever, this is because the mind's not yet comfortable with impermanence and that mind had a certain craving and now the body isn't comfortable so now it goes to the anger so a person who's trained their mind really well even if they stump their toe for example they would be able to remain calm and peaceful during that time they would know that that pain that they're experiencing is impermanent so the buddha is giving these examples of if you're around a teacher or an ordained practitioner and you observe that they're bothered by the cold or the heat or you know they get irritable and grumpy when they're hungry or thirsty or these other things that the buddha is talking about then you know that there's not yet patience in the mind they're still craving desire attachment so the buddha is suggesting that you support somebody who's able to patiently endure these kind of things and they're not discontent because of them because it's just impermanence that's all these things are and then the last one the fifth one here he talks about one who goes what he's talking about here is a person whose mind is liberated which he actually shares here towards the end freedom from strong feelings elimination enlightenment so he's saying support enlightened beings and one of the ways you'll know somebody's enlightened is they won't have any reservations about traveling to a part of the world that they've never been to before. Because if there's fear of traveling to a certain place, then the mind is still not enlightened. And if there's fear traveling to a place you've never been before, then how would the Buddhist teachings be able to continue to be shared? So if somebody's never been to a certain region of the world and they're invited to come and share teachings as an enlightened being, an enlightened being would say, sure, I'll come because they already know that they've extinguished all their unwholesome gamma and there's nothing that's going to bother them. They should be able to make a wise decision about where they go in the world. They wouldn't be fearful or scared or afraid of traveling to any particular region of the world. But if they have all these material possessions that they're holding on to and they're kind of hunkered down in one place and they're not willing to travel and go somewhere else to share the teachings, then the mind is still holding on to all these material possessions and they're not necessarily somebody you would be willing to support because in order for these teachings to be shared all throughout the world, a teacher who is enlightened would need to be able to travel to anywhere and anywhere that somebody invites them to teach because those people would like to learn you would like to see that these people would be willing to travel no matter where they're invited to actually travel in the world so what questions do you guys have on this chapter it doesn't appear there are any questions at this time okay chapter 65 
persons who are worthy of gifts, blind discourse. So two monks, possessing four qualities a monk is worthy of gifts, worthy of hospitality, worthy of offerings, worthy of respectful salutations and unsurpassed view of merit for the world. What for? Virtual, practicing, virtue, practicing moral conduct, speed, patience and gentleness. Possessing these four factors, a monk is worthy of gifts, worthy of hospitality, worthy of offerings, worthy of respectful salutations and unsurpassed view of merit for the world. Okay, thank you, Dani. So I explain these four qualities down here and I show you exactly how to understand them. This first one of virtue is related to the moral conduct section of the Eightfold Path, right speech, right action, right livelihood. Speed, an enlightened being isn't going to be doing things quickly. That's not what the Buddha is actually talking about when he's talking about speed because an enlightened being is going to be very deliberate because they're going to be very conscious of the things that they're doing. They're not going to be just nose to the grindstone, go, 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 go all the time. They're going to be very conscious and very deliberate about the things that they're doing, whether it's their speech and their actions or other decisions that they're making. Instead, what he's talking about here is he's talking about the enlightenment factor of energy, which the enlightenment factor of energy energy is what I described earlier where the mind isn't dull and lethargic and complacent. Instead, there's this effort, determination, ambition, initiative, motivation, vigor, enthusiasm, this willingness to do something. That's what he's talking about here. An enlightened being isn't going to sit around on the sofa and eat potato chips all day and watch TV, right? They might do that for a period of time where they're sitting back and relaxing, but they're not going to do that for enormous amounts of time, day on day on day on day on day. They're going to be actively involved in the world, particularly somebody who's teaching, which is what the Buddha is referring to here, is someone to support that's teaching. They're going to be actively involved in sharing the teachings in all different ways through classes, courses, retreats, and various things that they need to do in order to share those teachings. So he's talking about the enlightenment factor of energy here, not doing things quickly. Then with patience, there's this fetter of restlessness that I describe in various classes, and this is where the mind is confused, distracted, worried, anxious. There's this kind of overactivity in the mind. It's the opposite of singleness of mind. So someone who has patience, they're going to have equanimity, which is mental calmness and composure, this evenness of temper, especially in difficult situations. So you would look for somebody who has patience. So as you're learning the teachings, Anybody that's sharing the teachings with you, they're going to need to be patient with you because you're not going to be able to learn them right away. You're going to need to hear things multiple times. You're going to need to ask questions multiple times. You might even ask the same question multiple times or different ways. So if a teacher is becoming impatient with their student, this person isn't enlightened and they wouldn't be the best person to support because they're not yet at the enlightened mental state where they can then be patient with their students. So they should have this calmness and composure. They should have patience with their students and understand that it's a gradual training, gradual practice and gradual progress. Anybody who's enlightened would know that. They would know that they themselves experience gradual training, gradual practice and gradual progress. So they wouldn't have the expectation that their students would just get it at the snap of a finger. If they're enlightened and they gradually work their way to enlightenment, they went through the gradual training, gradual practice, and gradual progress, so they know that their students are going to need to do exactly the same thing, so they should be able to be patient. If they have expectations or craving or, or wants for their students to get everything right away, then this wouldn't be the best person to support, is what the Buddha is sharing. And then this last quality is this gentleness that anybody who's sharing these teachings that somebody might be interested to support should have a certain amount of gentleness about them because there's going to be challenges as they teach and as they do things and interact in the world. They're going to need to be polite, kind, friendly, and respectful with all beings, their students, but also other people as well in the community because in order for a teacher to share the teachings, 
They need support of their students, yes, but there's also other people in the community too. For example, here in Thailand, you know, I have people that make signs for me. I have people that print books for me, that print different things. People at the temple who do a little bit of cleaning around the temple. There's different people that are here in Chiang Mai that support me above and beyond just the students. You know, there's a whole community of people. There's cleaners that I hired at one point to come clean the temple and different things like this. And if a teacher is interacting with these people with harshness, then this is creating difficulties for the community. So an individual who's developing a community of students should have a certain gentleness to them, not only with their students, definitely with their students, but also with other people around them as well. And you should see this politeness, kindness, friendliness, and respectfulness amongst the qualities of mind that this teacher would have that you might be interested to support. What questions do you guys have on this chapter? Yes, sir, Maria has um, questions on YouTube and Facebook. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. On YouTube, there's a well, couple of questions from Max going back to the previous chapter. He asks, I assume we still need to maintain some discernment and maybe avoid traveling to an area where there might be war, etc. Exactly. So there's always discernment in everything that we do. So if somebody invited a teacher into a war zone in order to share the teachings of the Buddha, that person's going to most likely decline that offer, not because they're not interested to share the teachings, but it would just be unwise to be in a war zone with bullets and missiles and bombs dropping, and then to be able to go share the teachings in that area. Or even there's certain governments nowadays that if we were invited into a certain country and we actually shared the teachings in that country, we could be arrested and jailed and maybe even executed. I know that when I was invited to Egypt to come teach this past summer, the Egyptians needed to get the approval of the government, of the security forces for me to be able to share the teachings. The government needed to know who I was, what my background was, where I'm from, what citizenship, what was I going to be teaching. I had to share some documents about what I was going to be sharing. And then the government, the security forces approved me to then be able to go into Egypt and actually share the teachings with their citizens. So there's these kind of things that a person's going to need to make wise decisions about. Yes, thank you, sir. Uh, he has a follow-up question. Also, to, to take care of this body by wearing a coat when it's cold or sunscreen when it's sunny? Yes, there's no harm in taking care of the physical body, but here an individual would need to be patient when they're experiencing those things. So yeah, if you use things to take care of the physical body, that's very wise because if the body degrades, then the body's going to die and the mind's not going to be here to be able to be trained. So this is just about not having discontentedness when you go out into the cold or the heat or experience some of these other aspects of impermanence is really all this is. Thank you, sir. Mm -hmm. And then on YouTube, Amina asks, teacher, how can we shift from giving more patience to others than we give to our, ourselves? What is the good way to find balance? Yeah, where impatience comes from is when there's craving, desire, attachment in the mind, the mind's going to be impatient, right? Because with craving, desire, attachment, the mind's going to want to go, 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 go. Come on, let's get it done. Let's go. Come on. I can't be patient here, right? Because the mind's craving, having desire and attachment, that mental longing and strong eagerness. So the more that you knock down craving, desire, attachment, you can arise this patience in the mind. And that's what ultimately leads to getting to the patience and eliminating the restlessness. And then wherever you're in a difficult situation, because remember I talked about equanimity here, you would like to arise this equanimity in the mind where the mind can be calm and steady and stable, evenness of temper. So wherever you see the opposite of that, where you see the mind wanting to go, 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 that's where you apply right effort and you restrain the mind. So you use right mindfulness, awareness of mind to observe whenever the mind is impatient and it's go, 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 and you see those cravings arising in the mind and where you see that, then you apply right effort to cut that off and let it go and restrain the mind and just realize that you need to practice patience and equanimity. Yes, thank you, sir. Mm -hmm. And then on YouTube, Tonka asks, 
Sharing the teachings when someone becomes enlightened is a sign of generosity. Is there a moral obligation to teach as well? No, there's no requirement for anybody to teach because not everybody is going to have the qualities of being a teacher because you know, everybody and anybody can get to enlightenment, but getting to enlightenment means that you're able to learn the teachings enough for yourself, that you're able to reflect and practice to develop your own mind. But having done that, not everybody's going to have the qualities to actually be a teacher. So someone can get to enlightenment and be a airplane pilot or get to enlightenment and be a food server or get to enlightenment and be a taxi cab driver because that's what their skills are above and beyond enlightenment. There's going to be other skills that we have that is our livelihood and how we choose to sustain our life in the world. There's going to be some people who are teachers and who are familiar with teaching. They enjoy teaching. It's part of what they do. It's their livelihood. And this is something that they choose to do as part of their livelihood. But not everybody is going to choose to do that. They don't have aspirations to do that. They don't necessarily have the skills to do that. So there's no moral obligation whatsoever. Your whole goal is for you to get to enlightenment. And having done that, it'll be wonderful for you, for all those close to you and all of humanity, but you're not required to actually teach. Instead, you know, you're going to probably potentially have other things. If you decided not to teach, you'll have plenty of other things that you might decide to do in the world as an enlightened being. And you'll do that much more peacefully and joyfully as an enlightened being than you ever thought possible. Wonderful. Thank you, sir. Mm -hmm. You're Uh, welcome. That appears to be all the questions that we have at this time. Okay, so now we're at chapter 66. Yes, sir. I'll read chapter 66. Persons who are worthy of gifts and discourse. So too, possessing five qualities, a monk is worthy of gifts, worthy of hospitality, worthy of offerings, worthy of respectful salutation, and unsurpassed field of merit for the world. What five? Virtue, practicing moral conduct, speed, gentleness, patience, and mildness. Possessing these five qualities, a monk is worthy of gifts, worthy of hospitality, worthy of offerings, worthy of respectful salutation, and unsurpassed field of merit for the world. All right. Thank you, Miranda. So here, this is exactly the same as the other chapter, except the Buddha has added this mildness here. So I use the same exact explanation that I've already provided, but then there's this mildness, which is the quality of having a lack of intensity or aggression, right? Where if the mind is aggressive and having intensity, the mind's not going to be mild or have this mildness. So where the mildness comes from is from arising this enlightenment factor of tranquility, where the mind is relaxed, but yet attentive and alert. There's this steadiness, this stability, this peacefulness and stillness of mind. So as you learn about the tranquility of mind and arising that enlightenment factor of tranquility, as the mind eliminates craving, desire, attachment, then there won't be this intensity, this aggression, this interest to fight and argue and fight, 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 right? This bitterness. So all of that will have been eliminated for somebody that would be ideal for sharing these teachings in the world and someone that you might choose to be your teacher or support as someone who's sharing teachings in the world. What questions do you guys have on this chapter? I have a question. The We've been studying for a while generosity and um, the worthiness of generosity people worthy of generosity. Um, What does that mean then for one who practices generosity uh, to beings who maybe are not deemed worthy of generosity or viewed as worthy of, um, of generosity? Okay, there's two things here. Let me help you with this. There's generosity and then there's merit which is also generosity, but it's a a unique type of generosity. So in order for you to get to enlightenment, you're going to need to practice generosity, which is the giving and sharing of more than is strictly required in any particular situation. So you helping a homeless person or you helping a local charity or you holding the door for somebody at a store as you're going in, that's generosity even. Picking up something off the ground, you know, sir, you dropped this or ma'am, you dropped 
this. This is generosity. It's more than is strictly required of your time, your effort, your energy, and your resources. It's helping you to eliminate selfishness, that you're willing to give and share your time, effort, energy, and resources. And you can practice generosity with anybody and everybody that you choose to do that with. And you should always do that from the middle so that you're not sacrificing and you're not lacking the basic needs that you need to sustain your life. So you can practice generosity with anybody and everybody. But in terms of developing merit, this is a unique type of generosity. It's still generosity where you're sharing your time, effort, energy, and resources more than is strictly required, but you're doing it towards the continued sharing of the Buddhist teachings. So right now with you moderating, this is generosity that is producing merit. You're providing your time, your effort, your energy, and your resources more than is strictly required towards the continuation of sharing these teachings. So that's generosity that is thus then producing merit. But you'll still need to practice generosity in other situations too. It's not that you would only practice generosity with someone who's worthy. Here, the Buddha is talking about this worthiness as it relates to producing merit. Because if you think about during the lifetime of the Buddha, there were countless people, as there are today, that are ordained and sharing these teachings. And the Buddha was helping you to discern who is it that you would like to support that is sharing the teachings. How would you then develop this merit and ensure that these teachings would continue in the world? You would look for these various qualities that he talked about. But that's in addition to your normal practice of generosity where you're just sharing your time, effort, energy, and resources with anybody that you might decide to do that with. And you get to make personal choices about how you choose to share your generosity. Like I mentioned, as simple as holding the door for somebody on the way into a store is generosity. And you don't have to determine if you know they have any of these qualities before you actually open the door and hold it for them because you're not trying to produce merit at that point. You're just looking to practice generosity and be a generous person, not being selfish. Okay, I understand, sir. And when we do these things, we should have a mindset of not doing it to produce merit, though, right? Not with the craving to produce merit or the idea of I'm I'm helping, like, for instance, suggesting the, the moderating, like, I'm helping so that I can increase merit. Right. You're doing it because more. you should practice generosity without any expectation of anything in return. But that's different than knowing what is transpiring as a result of your practice. So for example, holding the door for somebody going into a store, you do that without any expectation of anything in return, even a simple thank you or a smile on the way in. You just hold the door because you know it's the right thing to do. This is for your practice. I'm holding the door. If this person says thank you or they grunt at me or they spit on me or whatever they're doing, I'm not holding this door because I expect them to do anything specific. I'm just doing it out of the generosity of my heart. And I know that this is a wise decision for me. So you're not doing it with any expectation, but you know with wisdom that it is helping you eliminate craving, desire, attachment. Same thing as you are practicing to moderate, you're doing this out of the generosity of your heart without any expectation of anything in return. However, you do have the wisdom to know that it's helping you with craving, desire, attachment, and it's helping to continue the teachings of the Buddha in the world. But you don't have any expectation that after every single class, David's going to say thank you or the community is going to say thank you. You're not looking for pleasant feelings just because you're moderating. You're not looking for admiration or this gratitude to be bestowed upon you. You're just doing it out of the generosity of your heart because you know it's the right and wise thing to do to help these teachings to be shared in the world. But you know that this is, because of wisdom, helping you to eliminate craving, and it is helping the teachings to continue in the world. That's just the wisdom part of it that you know is transpiring, but you're not doing it with the expectation that these things occur. Okay, I understand, sir. So I do notice with the example of moderating, I do notice that it does help the mind stay single-minded um, and focused during class. 
So I would want to cut that off and just keep doing what I'm doing, not have the, like, not excited, but pleasant feelings of knowing that moderating does help my mind, this mind, stay single-minded and focused. Right. The Correct. Bit- Right. The Buddha just shares to not have expectations of, that these things will occur, but know that they will occur. Have the wisdom that okay. you're in, that you're enhancing the mind by you moderating, you know, talking to other moderators. They've shared that it's helped them to eliminate shyness. It's helped them to eliminate some personal existence view. You know, there have been other benefits. They're able to interact in the class more readily. So they've been able to learn the teachings more closely. So there are these benefits that are happening. But the reason why those benefits are happening is because of the natural law of gamma, of cause and effect and action and result, that because you're practicing the wholesome quality of generosity, you making that wise decision in any way that you're practicing generosity, not just to produce merit, but any generosity, as you put generosity out into the world, then there's going to be things that come back to you because of the natural law of gamma that are wholesome, but you're not choosing to practice that generosity because you expect those wholesome things to come back, but you just know that they will. Because when there's the expectation that they will occur, then when they don't occur, the mind's going to be discontent because of it. So in order to get to pure generosity, a practitioner needs to be able to share their time, effort, energy, and resources without any expectation of anything in return. And this pure generosity is going to produce beneficial results, but that's not why you're doing it. But you have wisdom that these things will occur. Okay. Thank you, sir. Mm-hmm. You're welcome. I don't think we have any other questions right now. Okay, so we're off to chapter 67 then. Correct. And I believe Banya's husband is going to read again. Sure. Persons who are worthy of gift and event this cause, so to monks possessing eight qualities. A monk is worthy of gift. Uh, worthy of hospitality, worthy of offerings, worthy of respectful salutation and unsurpassed field of merit for the world. What eight here among is virtuous practicing moral conduct? He resides restrained by the training guidelines, process of wholesome conduct and wise decision making. Seeing danger in the slightest fault, having undertaken the training guidelines, he trains in them. He respects fully, eats whatever food they give him, whether rough or excellent, without being annoyed. He is disinterested in bodily, verbal, and mental misconduct. He is disinterested in the acquisition of the numerous kinds of evil and wholesome qualities. He is gentle and pleasant to live with, and he does not attempt to agitate other monks. He reveals his tricks, ploys, schemes, and ruses as they really are to the teacher or to his wise fellow monks so that they can make an effort to stamp them out of him. He's one who takes up the training between whether or not other monks train. I will train. When moving, he moves only uh, along a straight path. In this connection, this is the straight path. Right will, right intention, right speech, right action, right livelihood, right effort, right mindfulness, and right concentration. He has aroused energy just willingly. Let only my skin, snoops, and bones remain. And let the flesh and blood dry up in this body. But I will not relax the energy so long as I have not attained what can be attained by strange 
energy and effort. Possessing these eight qualities among is worthy of gifts, worthy of hospitality, worthy of offerings, worthy of respectful salutation, and unsurpassed field of merit for the world. All right. Thank you, sir. All right. So here, a number of these we've already been discussing to a certain degree, particularly this first one about virtuous conduct. This one is pretty self-explanatory that if you're making offerings to a teacher of food, that they should be willing to just eat it. And food is just to sustain the body. But if there's central desire there, they might only have preference for one type of food or another. And if they're annoyed, then they're not yet enlightened. So the Buddha is saying, you know, you should look for a teacher that when you offer them food, that they're willing to eat whatever is offered to them. Now, given nowadays that we have different practitioners who are moving to plant-based food supplies. So for example, if somebody offered me food that had meat in it, I would accept the offering and I would probably give that to somebody else who might choose to eat that, but I wouldn't eat it myself, but I wouldn't be annoyed that somebody made that offering to me. So it doesn't mean that a individual who receives an offering of food has to absolutely eat everything that's given to them, but there shouldn't be this annoyment, right? So I've actually had students sometimes not knowing me very well, it might be the first time they've met me or second time they've offered me food, they've given me some food that had meat in it. And then, you know, I took a bite out of it because it, it looked like a, a croissant actually, but it had a hot dog in the middle of the croissant. And then I was like, oh wow, that's got meat in it. Okay, well, you know, I'm not gonna eat that. But there shouldn't be this annoyment when the mind experiences this. So they should just be pleased with whatever offers been offered to them and then eat whatever food is needed for them. So in this case, if somebody was offered meat when they don't eat meat, they shouldn't be annoyed. They should be able to choose to do something else with that, but they should still be appreciative of the offer and that this student has practiced generosity. Then this disinterest in bodily, verbal, and mental misconduct, this is around the moral conduct. He is gentle and pleasant to live with doesn't attempt to agitate other monks because during the lifetime of the Buddha, all these monks were essentially cohabitating together in various places. So an individual who's close to enlightenment or enlightened would be gentle and pleasant to live with. There wouldn't be this agitation or trying to agitate other people, even though if they are agitated, they're causing it themselves, but you shouldn't be doing things like playing loud music all the time or, you know, uh, banging things at 2 a.m. in the morning and things like this, even though if someone got angry or agitated at that, they're causing it through their own craving. But you understanding the teachings, you wouldn't be doing those things because you're not interested in creating difficulties in the environment. This revealing tricks, ploys, schemes, and ruses, this is where like if somebody is kind of like malicious or they can kind of hide things or, you know, they can do things, you know, very tricky things. When you're living amongst a community of ordained practitioners, those other practitioners are there to really help you on your journey. And what the Buddha is saying here is essentially to admit to the teacher, like, yeah, I know I'm not supposed to eat after 12 o'clock as part of the teachings of the Buddha, but I've been sneaking this donut every day at 2 p.m., you know, and the way that I do that is that I sneak into the bathroom and I eat it there and whatever, whatever, right? Like, so any kind of tricks or ploys, the Buddha is saying, you know, if you're really interested in getting to enlightenment, that somebody would divulge those kind of things when they're living in a communal environment so that the other monks or the other ordained practitioners can help you to eliminate these tricks and ploys and schemes so that you can more closely practice the teachings. And this is somebody who the Buddha is saying, yes, this is someone who you would like to support, someone who's willing to share with the teacher that they're doing these kinds of things. They're willing to admit their shortcomings, essentially. A one who takes up training is determined, right? Even though other people are choosing not to train, that that person is willing to train. So here in Thailand, there's about 300,000 monks and not all of them are necessarily practicing very closely. So if we based our practice on whether somebody else is practicing or not, then the mind is still attached and saying, you know, I'm only gonna practice if that person learns and practices. But the Buddha is saying that you should look to support somebody who's willing to train regardless of what other people are choosing to do or not do. And that you would look for somebody, once again, who's 
moving along and practicing the Eightfold Path. And then also somebody who looks at this body, what does it say here? Willingly let only my sin, my skin, sinews, bones remain and let the flesh and blood dry up in this body. But I will not relax the energy so long as I have not attained what can be attained by strength, energy, and effort. So what he's talking about here is basically you're going to learn and practice the teachings all the way until death. That as long as the mind is unenlightened, the person that you would like to support in terms of offerings is the person who's not going to give up on the path to enlightenment. Someone who's willing to continue to be diligent and dedicated and determined to develop their practice no matter what, even all the way to death. If you look at the Buddha's life, he actually taught all the way until his last breath. His last breath, his last words was a teaching. And then he taught and then he laid his head down and he died. This is what he's saying is to be that determined where you're not going to give up on the path to enlightenment. And the person that you would look to support as a teacher is someone who's not going to, you know, just give up with the first challenge that they encounter in terms of their career and teaching. But instead, they should be able to persevere and apply wisdom to overcome any challenges that they're experiencing in terms of as they're setting up in their career of teaching. What questions do you guys have on this chapter? I don't hear we have any questions at this time. Okay. So now we go to chapter 68. Persons who are worthy of gifts. Twelfth disclosure. Discourse. Monks possessing eight qualities. A monk is worthy of gifts, worthy of hospitality, worthy of offerings, worthy of respectful salutation, and unsurpassed field of merit for the world. What eight? Here, monks, a virtuous practicing moral conduct, he resides un, he resides restrained by the training guidelines possessed of wholesome conduct and wise decision making, seeing danger in the slightest faults. Having undertaken the training guidelines, he trains in them. Two, he has learned much, remembers what he has learned, and accumulates what he has learned. Those teachings that are good in the beginning, good in the middle, and good in the end, with the right meaning and phrasing, which proclaim the perfectly complete and pure spiritual life. Such teachings as these, he has learned much of, retained in mind, recited verbally, investigated with the mind, and penetrated well by view. Three, he has aroused energy. He is strong, firm in effort, and has not cast off the duty of cultivating wholesome qualities. Four, he is a forest dweller, one who resorts to remote lodgings. Five, he has vanquished discontentedness and excitement. He has overcame discontentedness whenever it arose. Six, he has vanquished fear and terror. He has overcame fear and terror whenever they arose. Seven, he gains at will without trouble or difficulty the four jhanas that constitute the higher mind and are dwellings in peacefulness in this very life. Eight, with the destruction of the taints, fetters, he has realized for himself with direct knowledge, experience in this very life, the taintless liberation of mind, liberation of wisdom, and having entered upon it, he resides in it. Possessing these eight qualities, a monk is worthy of gifts, worthy of hospitality, worthy of offerings, worthy of respectful salutation and unsurpassed field of merit for the world. All right. Thank you, Chrissy. I think what I'm going to do is just open up to whatever questions you guys have. Many of these we've already been talking about. Some of them are unique to this particular chapter, but let me just see which ones you guys have questions about. Okay. Miranda has hand raised. Um, yes. Thank you, ma'am. Sir, about 
Number six, this vanquishing fear and terror. Is this something that is usually attained gradually and where we can notice the fading of the feelings of fear or terror? Yeah, everything on the path to enlightenment is all gradual training, gradual practice, gradual progress. So even the elimination of fear, because as the cravings are diminishing, if you have a really strong fear, you know, that's not going to just pop out of the mind like that. There needs to be this gradual training. So like if you're afraid of the dark or you're afraid of heights or you're afraid of spiders or any number of things, the mind needs gradual training to gradually let that craving go. So you'll notice this gradual diminishing of it. And then once you feel like it is gone, you should still put the mind in that situation, you know, multiple times after that, just to be sure that it is actually gone. Okay. Yes, I, there is a fear of heights. I think you remember from uh, the retreat this summer. Um, okay. Yes, that makes sense. Thank you, sir. You're welcome. It appears that's all the questions we have right now. Okay. So now we go to chapter 69. I have Donnie. I think he's going to read this chapter. Yes, we see. Persons who are worthy of gifts. The Dean discourse. So two monks possessing five qualities among these worthy of gifts, worthy of hospitality, worthy of offerings, worthy of respect, salutation, and unsurpassed view of merit for the world. What five? He patiently endures forms, patiently endures sounds, patiently endures odors, patiently endures flavors, and patiently endures physical objects. One, and how is it that a monk patiently endures forms? Here, when the monk sees the form with the eye, it does not become cultivated by attempting form and can concentrate his mind. It is in this way that the monk and patiently endure forms. Two, and how is it that the monk patiently endure sounds? Here, when the monk hears a sound with the ear, it does not become cultivated by attempting sound and can concentrate his mind. It is in this way that the monk patiently endure sounds. Three. And how is it that a monk patiently endures odors? Here, when a monk smells an odor with the nose, it does not become captivated by attempting odor and can concentrate his mind. It is in this way that a monk patiently endures odors. Four, and how is it that the monk patiently endures flavors? Here, when a monk experiences a flavor with the tongue, it does not become captivated by attempting flavor and can concentrate his mind. It is in this way that the monk patiently endure flavors. Five. And how is it that the monk patiently endure physical objects? Here, when a monk feels a physical object with the body, he does not become captivated by attempting physical object and can concentrate his mind. It is in this way that the monk patiently endures physical objects. Possessing these five qualities among his body of gifts, body of hospitality, Worthy of offerings, worthy of respectful salutation, and as the best field of merit for the world. All right. Thank you, Donnie. So this is related to the five chords of sensual pleasure. This is related to the six sense bases, but we just include the five sense bases here of the eyes, ears, nose, tongue, and the body. Here, what the Buddha is explaining is that when you encounter these as a, a teacher or someone who you might be interested to make offerings to, you should observe that there's this patience, that their mind is not discontent when they're experiencing certain physical forms that they see through the eyes, certain sounds that they hear in the ears, certain odors that they smell, certain flavors that they taste, and certain physical objects that come in contact with the body. There should be this patience. There shouldn't be any irritation or annoyance. The mind should continue to be concentrated even when there's disruption of anything with any kind of impermanence because a teacher whose mind is enlightened any kind of form or sound or odor or flavor or physical objects, these are all just impermanent things. These aren't permanent and their mind would understand impermanence. So if there's a certain sound, for example, that comes out of the speakers of a computer and the teacher gets irritated or annoyed, this is showing that they're still craving desire attachment in the mind, that they're not able to be patient and concentrated. They're not understanding impermanence and their mind has 
hasn't been trained to understand impermanence and be able to accept it. So therefore, the Buddha is saying, look for somebody who's able to remain concentrated, remain focused, and that their mind isn't shaken up by any kinds of form, sounds, odors, flavors, or physical objects. In the seven chords of central pleasure, the chord is the craving, desire, attachment. If there's a craving for agreeable forms or agreeable sounds or agreeable odors, agreeable flavors or agreeable physical objects, then when something is disagreeable, the mind's going to be discontent. So by training the mind to eliminate craving, desire, attachment, it's no longer longing and yearning through the sense spaces then the mind can ultimately be peaceful and joyful all the time because it's not having agreeable and disagreeable contact. As long as there's craving in the mind, the mind's going to see it as there's agreeable contact and disagreeable contact. But when there's no craving in the mind, it's just contact. There is no agreeable and disagreeable anymore. Those things are gone because there's no craving. That is, the mind wants this or expects this or it doesn't want that and it it doesn't expect that. There still will be preferences that an enlightened being might have a preference. Like, I prefer to do it this way or I'd like to do it this way or have an interest to do it that way. But the mind of an enlightened being won't be shaken up in discontent when it doesn't happen those ways because there's not a want, an expectation, a craving, a longing, a yearning. Instead, there's just a preference or there's an interest or they would like it to be done a certain way. But their mind can remain peaceful, calm, serene, and content with joy even when those things aren't happening that way because it's not possible for things to permanently happen the way the mind wants or the way the mind craves. So that's why as long as there's craving, desire, attachment in the mind, it will have this concept of agreeable and disagreeable contact. It will only experience pleasant feelings when it gets agreeable contact. It will experience painful feelings when it gets disagreeable contact. But when there's no craving and there's just a preference of the way you prefer things to be, then there's not this agreeable and disagreeable. It's just whatever is happening. And then the mind can be peaceful, calm, serene, and content with joy no matter what. And that's what the Buddha is saying, that you should look for somebody to support that's able to essentially patiently endure and remain focused and concentrated even when they experience impermanence with form, sounds, odors, flavors, and physical objects. Questions on this chapter? Yes, it appears Marina has her hand raised. Um, yes, thank you, ma'am. Um, Apiko had asked a question on YouTube. Is it possible for the Buddha, or really any other enlightened being, to cry or feel sad? No, they wouldn't be able to feel sad. It's possible to cry because crying isn't an emotion. It's a bodily action. And someone can actually cry from joy, right? There can be so much laughter, so much joy in the mind. You can actually have some some tears come out of the eyes. So oftentimes people associate crying with the mind feeling sad. But crying is a bodily action. And it's not dependent on the mind feeling sad. So an enlightened being won't feel sadness at all. A Buddha wouldn't, an enlightened being wouldn't. But if something funny is said and someone's laughing, there could actually be a little bit of tears, right? So that can help you to understand that, that there's a difference between a bodily action, which is crying, versus a discontent feeling, which is the sadness. These two things aren't necessarily connected, even though they're oftentimes associated with each other, because someone who is sad can cry, but someone can also be joyful and cry as well. But it's a different type of crying, right? We've experienced those kind of things. Yes, wonderful. Thank you, sir. Mm -hmm. There are no more questions on YouTube and Facebook at this time. Okay, so it looks like we're going to the last chapter for today. Yes, sir. I'll read chapter 70. Persons who are worthy of gifts, 14th discourse. So too, possessing six qualities, a monk is worthy of gifts, worthy of hospitality, worthy of offerings, worthy of respectful salutation, an unsurpassed field of merit for the world. But what six? Here, a monk patiently endures forms, patiently endures sounds, patiently endures odors, patiently endures flavors, patiently endures physical objects, and patiently endures mental objects. Possessing these six qualities, 
A monk is worthy of gifts, worthy of hospitality, worthy of offerings, worthy of respectful salutation, an unsurpassed field of merit for the world. All right. Thank you, Miranda. This is exactly the same pretty much as the last chapter. It's just that this sixth sense base is included, which includes the mental objects. So I think you guys probably understand the other five fairly well. Let me talk about mental objects in this sixth sense base of the mind. So as the mind is unenlightened, it's going to have craving, desire, attachment. It's going to be longing and yearning through the sense bases. It's going to want agreeable contact because it has certain cravings in there. It's going to want to only see agreeable forms, smell agreeable odors. It's going to want and crave and long for certain sounds. It's going to want and crave and long for certain flavors and agreeable flavors, and as well as physical objects. And also mental objects. But then when that craving's in there, because it's chasing after pleasant feelings and wanting that agreeable contact, it's also then going to sometimes experience disagreeable contact because it can't permanently get its cravings fulfilled. So when it's experiencing disagreeable contact, it's going to experience painful feelings. So what these mental objects are, the way I describe them is like containers, right? But a way to understand the sixth sense base of the mind is that not only can you come in contact with forms, sounds, odors, flavors, and physical objects, but have you ever been sitting somewhere and you've been thinking about the past and something really pleasurable that's happened in the past or really painful that's happened in the past and the mind is thinking about that. Maybe if it's something pleasurable, the mind might be longing and yearning for that pleasurable thing. And it's not content in the present moment because it's longing, oh gosh, I just wish I made all that money like I used to in the past. Or, oh gosh, I just wish I had that boyfriend or that girlfriend or that husband or that wife or that car or those shoes. I just really wish I had that again. The mind's not content in the present moment. It can also do the same thing about the future. Like say you know you're going on a holiday or a vacation or something and it's like four weeks from now and the mind's just longing and yearning like, oh man, I just can't wait to get out of work. Four weeks from now, I'm going to be in the Bahamas and I just can't wait to get on the beach and enjoy that cool air and that blue water. Oh man, that that's so good. So the mind, because of its longing and yearning and craving through the mind itself, it can't be content in the present moment because it wants something outside of itself, either from the past or in the future. It wants something. And this is the mind longing and yearning and having certain mental objects like central desire in this case, or there's other mental objects as well. So those first five of the eyes, ears, nose, tongue, and body, I think you guys might understand the longing and yearning through those sense bases for form, sounds, odors, flavors, and physical objects. But I'd like to make sure that you understand how the mind longs within itself and it has certain mental objects of where it's longing for the past or longing for the future. And then this is going to cause it discontentedness when it does this. And oh, by the way, this all relates to the Buddha describing who would be worthy of gifts is somebody who can patiently endure these things and that their mind isn't longing and yearning through these sense bases. But you would need to have an understanding of these sense bases in order to discern whether somebody's able to patiently endure them or not. So I'd like to be sure you guys understand what the mind sense base is so that you guys can determine this for yourself. So I'll open up to any questions that you guys have. I don't think we have any questions at this time, sir. Okay. Well, that's the last chapter for today, chapter 70. Next week, we're going to be in chapter 71 through chapters 80. And again, if you guys would like to read those beforehand, that's wonderful. You'll probably have certain questions based on those chapters. And then the week after that, we're going to be in chapters 81 through 88. And that's the end of the Pali Canon in English study group. It would have been a year and a half from the very beginning all the way until that particular class that we studied. And then we're going to be restarting the Pali Canon in English study group on January 28th, starting with volume two, 
chapters 1 through 10. So we just have two more weeks here that we're finishing out this particular book, and then we'll be restarting from the very beginning. And somebody can come into this program at any time. You don't have to start from the beginning because it's the group learning program, which is actually restarting tomorrow from the very beginning. That's a seven-month program that covers volume one of this book series, and that provides the framework and the foundation to understand the path to enlightenment. And then the Pali Canon and English Study Group kind of fills in and gives you more detail about this framework or this foundation that you understand as part of the group learning program. So you guys are welcome to attend the group learning program or the Pali Canon and English Study Group. And if you're listening to this on the replay with YouTube or Facebook or the podcast you can understand that both of these programs are restarting and you guys are welcome to attend live or continue to listen to the replays i would like to thank all of you guys for joining thank you guys for reading it's wonderful having moderators and students that are reading this is really helpful for you guys to study in this way and i can see a whole lot of care as you guys are helping each other through the class and the moderators being very respectful and the students being very respectful. This is wonderful to see you guys practicing the teachings. So this is what we're going to be doing on Sunday and next Saturday. And then on Wednesday, I'm going to start the four part series on breathing mindfulness meditation, building students up from the very beginning to build up their breathing mindfulness meditation practice. So thank you all for joining. I'll see you in one of these future classes. Have a very lovely and wonderful rest of your day. Sawadee Thank you for listening to this podcast. To provide support for this podcast, visit patreon.com forward slash support Buddha. To access more teachings, visit buddhadailywisdom.com. There, you will discover a full range of courses, retreats, and online resources to assist you on the path to enlightenment. Remember to establish a daily, consistent meditation practice, along with learning and practicing these teachings. A well-developed meditation practice is the foundation in which to train the mind to attain enlightenment.